Hi, I'm Pastor Michael Faulkner, pastor of Outreach here at Victory Church. When this season of racial unrest began to unfold, my friend and pastor Ed Crenshaw and I began having conversations about what was going on and what we could do about it. And I thought, wow, this would be great if we involved other leaders in this conversation as well. And we came up with Ed Talks. I'm sure you'll enjoy listening to the depth, the wisdom, and the understanding that transpires during these conversations. This is Ed Talks. We're honored today to have with us as our guest, Dr. William Moore, pastor of 10th Memorial Baptist Church in Philadelphia, where he has been in leadership since 1974. His ministry has not, however, been limited to being the pastor of 10th Memorial Church. He is a leader in so many different areas in the greater Philadelphia region. He has been the co-chair of the Billy Graham campaign. He is one of the founders and a longtime president of Philadelphia Black Clergy. He's been involved in senior housing and then making housing available for first-time home buyers in challenged parts of Philadelphia. He's a respected leader today, and we are really blessed and honored to have him with us. We know that you'll be enriched by our conversation. So glad to have with us Dr. William Moore, who has been at 10th Memorial Baptist Church in Philadelphia since 1974. That's a long time at one church, isn't it? And, yes, it is. And I, I have discovered one thing about longevity in ministry. It's not just what you're doing today that keeps you in ministry. It's usually the fact that you have a strong call from God, because if you're like any other pastor, you've had some challenges along the way that might have made you give up had you not felt a strong sense of God's call. Can you just share a little bit about your call to ministry, your call to Philadelphia, your call to the church that you pastor? I, um, I acknowledge my call uh, at the age of 16. Uh, and like so many other preachers, I, I, I ran a, away from it because I had a feeling that that's what God wanted me to do. But I wasn't settling until uh, the age of 18. And um, there was a time when I couldn't eat without the call sitting down to the table with me. I couldn't go to bed without uh, the call going to bed with me when I would awaken in the middle of the night, uh, the call would be right there. And even during the day, it was something that was constantly uh, with me. And uh, I shared this with my pastor uh, at the time, and uh, he kind of passed it off and said, well, you know, you can't sleep, maybe you ate too much, so go back and pray. And so he uh, sent me uh, back two or three times, uh, and uh, finally I said, I've got to do it. I've got to do it. I've got to go. And so uh, in 1991, I uh, acknowledged the call at 18, and I preached my uh, first sermon, and I've been going on ever since then, and it gets sweeter and better day by day. And I know that it was the Lord's doing, and I know that um, that I made the right decision because if I had gone into anything else, I would not have been satisfied. Wow. And tell me a little bit. You grew up in North Carolina, is that correct? And then you somehow made your way to Philadelphia. Tell me about that transition and that call. Yes, I did. Uh, I grew up in North Carolina. I was educated in North Carolina, started uh, my seminary work there, and came to uh, Philadelphia in 1974, uh, where I finished my uh, seminary training at uh, Lutheran Theological Seminary in a new program that we had. Uh, and I was one of the uh, first graduates uh, in, that, uh, in that program. But so far as coming to Philadelphia, I never really dreamed that I would come to a large city. I felt that always I wanted to give full time to the ministry. Uh, and I thought that I would go to perhaps a larger city uh, in North Carolina, Charlotte, or Greensboro, Winston-Salem, uh, somewhere like that. Because in eastern North Carolina, uh, most uh, churches had uh, pastors who were 
of bivocational, and there were very few churches that could pay pastor full time that they could uh, take care of their families and, and their family and their other needs. And so um, I always felt that that would be, uh, but I came to uh, Philadelphia as a result of a friend uh, that I pastored with in my first church in New Bern, North Carolina. It was a, about three miles from where I was, uh, I was raised. I came up several years uh, doing his revival. And one night there was a deacon there uh, doing the tape recorder days uh, who was recording the message and came up to me after the service and said, uh, uh, we are without a pastor. Uh, would you come and preach for us? And uh, I kind of passed it off because Philadelphia was not on my agenda, uh, agenda but apparently was on God's agenda. And so finally, uh, finally I came and uh, ended up meeting with the, uh, with the pastor research committee. And their question to me was, uh, if we call you the pastor, will I come? And I said, uh, I'll have to pray about it. And I talked with my wife, uh, Pauline, about it. Uh, and she said, uh, William, if uh, the Lord calls you, uh, you have to go. And uh, uh, with her encouragement and the Lord's pushing, uh, I came. And so 46, 47 years later, here yeah, I am. Well, we're so glad that you answered God's call to come to Philadelphia. And obviously you've had a tremendous ministry here. Uh, one of the founders and longtime leaders of the Black Clergy of Philadelphia and involved more recently, I, I know, in the Philadelphia Leadership Foundation, also on the committee to bring Billy Graham here in 1992. You've just been involved in so many things to bless the city. Now, coming from North Carolina, it's a big switch to move to a northeastern city. And I know a little bit about that because I was raised down south and never would have dreamed that I would come to a place like Philadelphia. And you know, down south, we uh, are thought of as, as having racial issues, racial problems. And I'm sure you saw a lot of that. And, uh, you know, especially coming to Philadelphia in 1974, it, that wasn't too long after Dr. Martin Luther King was assassinated. And there were some pretty tense moments in terms of race relations in the years before and after that. So can you tell a little bit about the impact of the civil rights movement and discrimination, what you've seen in the church that uh, impacted you early on in your ministry? Well, I grew up, uh, uh, as you said, in North Carolina. And then during the time that I grew up, everything was segregated. Restrooms, lunch counters, schools, everything. I went to school. Um, to uh, an all-black school uh, and um, without a lot of resources because most of what we got uh, at that time in the school system uh, from uh, the books to the buses uh, to the equipment, all of it was passed down uh, from, uh, from, the, uh, from the white schools when they got new uh, equipment. Uh, and early on in life, by having to go to a colored restaurant, I knew that there was, there was something, something wrong. Uh, however, my parents uh, taught me and my community. Uh, I was raised by a village, and uh, your parents kept up with you. They didn't let you run the street uh, from sunup to sundown. Uh, there, were, there was community discipline. My daddy said to me, son, I don't have much ground, but when the sun goes down, I want you on some party. And if you were uh, away, uh, you know, they would ask if your mom and your daddy knew where you were. But wherever I went, whether it was a school with all black teachers, all black principals, uh, going to an all black church, all black preachers, having very little contact uh, with the white community, uh, I, I was told that I was not any better than anybody else, but you could do anything in the world that you want. And so with that reinforcement and that encouragement, I made up my mind early in life that I would use my life to make things better rather than to walk around better. Uh, and all along the way, God has given me uh, experiences, even uh, in North Carolina, uh, that helped me to really uh, enforce that. Well, I know that can't be an easy path to choose. I remember the summer before I became a follower of Christ. I had spent some time in the Army and was getting ready to go back to college and worked on a loading dock 
in Indianola, Mississippi, which is in the Delta. And, it, and I remember talking to my foreman, who was a bivocational Baptist pastor, Af- African-American man, and we were talking about race relations. And he was one of the most loving people uh, that you could meet and uh, didn't come across as bitter to me, but he did say it's hard not to be bitter when you have to go to the back door of Pea Soups, which was a local restaurant, to order your food. You know, I, I, I think a lot of times those of us in the white church, if you want to call it that, there's really only one church I think that you have devoted yourself to, uh, but white Christians sometimes don't know uh, what we're supposed to do. Are we supposed to have empathy for the challenges that our African-American brothers and sisters in Christ have had to endure? Are we supposed to, to feel it? And frankly, when you look at something like the George Floyd murder and you don't feel something, if you don't have some empathy, if you don't begin to relate to the challenge of being African-American in American culture still today, I would wonder if we are appropriately reflecting the heart of Jesus. What would you say, what would you say to our, our white brothers and sisters about what, we, what we're supposed to feel right now? Well, I, I, natu- naturally, you, you do, I do, uh, you know, you do become angry, you become upset. Uh, and upset because when God sets you free, uh, you want everybody else to experience that. And what I say to my white brothers and sisters is, is try to do like I do. Walk outside of the context of your own experience. And when you walk in somebody else's shoes, you begin to understand what they're coming from. And then you don't allow other people's problems uh, to be your problem. I know there were white people who did not like black people, but there were some who did. And, and yet they were constrained because of white privilege. They didn't know how to, uh, you know, what to do, how to, how to express themselves. Uh, and then even with their white friends and black friends, how to have an honest uh, and an uncomfortable conversation. Because sometimes, uh, and I have many white friends and, and, and they're beautiful and wonderful people. And after a while, you know, color doesn't matter. You look at, you know, God knit you together. So all of that stuff becomes that divides us become, you know, irrelevant. But God gives you the kind of people uh, that you want to be around. If you want to be around good people, God will help you to find good people. But he will also place you in challenging situations where you can use the context of your experience uh, in order to talk to to other people to try to, uh, to bring them along. And because other people are bitter, I don't let other people bring me down to it. Uh, bitterness. That's their problem, and I don't ride uh, in, in that boat. But I ask God to say, how can I talk with this brother or sister to bring them along? And 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 you don't have to go out uh, and uh, yell and scream at anybody. You know, my parents uh, told me that, you know, you don't have to, um, uh, to burn down a house to kill a fly. So sometimes we magnify things much bigger than we, uh, than we do when we can have a civil conversation, and God will give you the moment. Sometimes we try to force things. We try to fight, uh, force conversations, and you cannot do that. God always has to orchestrate that moment that you can have that that discussion uh, and and have you to walk in experiences where you can uh, make a difference. And when you begin to make a difference in enough situations, you have a critical mass of people where something is happening, like we do now. Uh, there was a time when we could not have the conversation that we're having now because we never had an honest discussion about white uh, privilege and racism. We have not had discussion like we have it right now because many of our white friends felt that, you know, everything was all right, but everything was not all right. And when you walk around, you know, feeling that everything is all right, you're not going to look at the other person's pain and say, well, what can I do uh, to get my foot off of your, your neck? Or what can I do uh, to not hold you, hold you down? God will, will bring you uh, to that point. And it's not that I have not had 
uh, negative experiences because uh, because I have. I mean, I remember when I could go into town, we didn't have cars, and uh, you know, the white boys would come by and yell at me and call me nigger. But uh, I would go on about uh, about my business. I would you know go down. I wouldn't let anybody uh, um, uh, pull me down to that. And even when I went to school, I had to go to school in the back of the bus. I had to sit in the colored section uh, of the uh, of the bus station. And even when I went to school, uh, I had to eat at uh, colored restaurants because we uh, could not do that. So when Reverend Jackson and others were in Greensboro, North Carolina, we were doing the same thing in Fayetteville. And so we would leave the campus uh, on Tuesdays and we would go in town uh, and uh, we would sit down at the restaurant and there were people who were far less trained that we were, that I was attempting to be and others students were attempting to be. And when you sat down, they said, well, you know, we don't serve colored people here. I said, well, I don't, I don't eat colored people. I want, I want, want a burger, you know, <laughs> with, uh, <laughs> with some mustard and then some cheese and, and, and a Coke. That's what I came in for. And uh, they would go and um, wait on the uh, white customers and, uh, we would just uh, sit there until everybody get uh, uh, frustrated. And, and lo and behold, we did this enough days, did this enough days. So thank God before uh, we went into uh, our, my second year uh, in uh, college, all of that uh, had, 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 had dissipated because of the advocacy that we, that we had as students. Wow. Well, thank you for what you did at that time. And I guess today it's easy for so many people who are younger than we are, who don't remember the Jim Crow days, don't remember the days of uh, separate but equal, who don't remember some of the segregation that you've just described, uh, it can easily seem like, oh, we're a long way from that. Things are so much better. We've had an African-American president, so this is a thing of the past. I hear some people say there's no such thing as white privilege. What, what would you say to uh, Americans, white Americans who really want to know the reality and who really want to be a part of making a difference? What, what do we need to know? What do we need to do? Well, I think we have to look at history. Uh, you know, we have to go back you know, a minute or two. We came to this country uh, against our will. Um, and white people did not have to do that. They came here free. Right, ran the Indians out, but you know, by and large, uh, they've had power. We came here against our will, 1619, and so here we in 2019. We have the same thing that we had uh, in 1619. Uh, we came here. We worked uh, on uh, the farms you know, in Mississippi and Alabama, and made cotton king and uh, tobacco queen uh, on the backs of the labor uh, of our peoples. Uh, being treated as uh, second-class citizens uh, and uh, being uh, uh, mistreated all of our lives. And the thing that we had to fight for as African-Americans, uh, white people had anyway. We, we have more amendments to the Constitution because we're Black than, than anybody else. But, but, but as a white person, you don't have that. That comes, what, what we've advocated for, come to white people as a privilege, the right to vote. And even now, we see how uh, folks are being frustrated uh, in order to just exercise the franchise uh, in, in voting. So that most of the things that we're fighting for, white people have them anyway because of, of white, white privilege. So how do we, and, and that's the way you think, because that's the way you have. And so it means that, 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 that you have to adjust how you think and how you approach things. You can't just obligatory say, uh, you know, everything uh, is, is all right. Um, and, 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 and likewise, we have to own what is happening, uh, not as white people, but also as black people, because there are some things that we have to do. We can't walk around, uh, you know, saying all, oh, you know, white people are bad and wrong, because that is absolutely not true. We all want the same thing. So how do we work to bring people to a common purpose uh, to what God made us? You know, we all want to uh, to, to go to school, to get a good education, and we choose to marry uh, and have children. We want to raise our children, and we want to be able to get them the things that they want to have, uh, you know, without restriction. But for African Americans, that's really not, not the case. So I think we have to draw a distinction between the life that we live 
and the life that white people live and how hard we have to work just to get things that come to white people because they because they are white. Now, a lot of young people today, and I think about my two daughters, they're ages 25 and 23, and they've been raised in a multi-ethnic environment. And uh, some of their best friends growing up were uh, different ethnicities, not just African-American, but from all over the world because of the nature of our church. And uh, so they have a little different perspective than a lot of white people. Uh, but one thing that I see among a lot of young people is this empathy. You know, a lot of people posted the black squares on their Instagrams, but I don't know that they're doing anything. Maybe they're marching in the streets or posting things on social media, but I'm wondering, are there actions that we need to take to really make some changes to address the problem of racism in America still today, especially in the church? Yeah, well, I think the church really has to own it, and the church has not owned it. I mean, there are a number of white churches who absolutely would not even entertain the discussion. It becomes uh, divisive uh, in that congregation uh, because I've heard it from a number of pastors. Or they become uh, just so uh, isolated in the world that they live in that they don't even want to uh, to work with uh, with uh, any African American to do anything that moves uh, the needle forward. Now they would do things that satisfy their, their conscience, you know, having a food program or something like this. But we got to go much further, uh, you know, beyond that. And even in multiracial churches. Uh, in most of the churches they are, you will find African American in the choir, but they're not in the pulpit preaching, they're not teaching, they're not doing anything that's you know meaningful, and, and not that singing is meaningful, not meaningful, but we can do something else, uh, you know, besides singing. So that I think until we begin to treat everybody the same and begin to do things uh, on an equal uh, basis, we're going to always be where we are. And the church has to own the problem of of racism. We cannot expect our government to do this. Uh, we can expect any other institution to do it. The church has to own that problem and take the take the leadership on it. And I think that, you know, for the time being, that white America has to carry the biggest share of the load, uh, because that's where uh, a, a lot of, you know, the racism is being perpetrated. So that they have to, to take the biggest share of the load. And, and by that, I mean, you have to talk to uh, to your colleagues, uh, to your parishioners, uh, because they will listen to you uh, much quicker than they would listen to me. It's not difficult for me uh, to have a conversation uh, about equity and justice uh, in my congregation, or even uh, marriage justice and all from my pulpit, because we believe, I do, I believe in John 3.16, but I also believe in Luke 4.18. And so just as you preach to get people saved, you also have to lift people uh, who live on the margins, whether they are they are white or black. And then we have to you know, help people to understand that you know white privilege is a problem, but poverty is not a black problem. We don't own the problem of, of poverty. There are as many poor white people as there are black people. There are many white people who are on credit assistance as they are black people. So that we have to really discard uh, those those myths, and then to hear a person. Uh, say that uh, that uh, institutional racism uh, is not a problem, is not living on this planet and this world. And so we've got to have these hard, hard conversations, no matter how uh, uncomfortable, uncomfortable they are. And I say, if you don't, and to my white black friend, if you don't have a white friend, get you one. If you don't have a white friend, don't have a black one, develop one, you know. So, because that's the way that a lot of this stuff breaks down, because when you walk together, you'll find that our heart bleed for the same thing. And there's no better place for that moral authority to start than in the church. You know, we don't have to continue to live isolated from one another. That uh, we have to go much further than just obligatory saying, you know, uh, some of my best friends are black. I mean, anybody can say that. You know, being a friend really means something. So, I mean, do you, do you do things together? Do you... Do you uh, do you share common things together? I have a right friend, and when there are things going on in, uh, in his family, he invites me. Uh, he's been to my church. He's been on 
on programs where they've honored me. Uh, and we walk together, we share together, and we can talk about anything, no matter how uncomfortable it is, so that we should step outside of our race and have developed friendships and relationships because this diverse world that God made is a beautiful world and his people are all too. Amen. I think that's so very well stated. It addresses one of the concerns that I have, that it's easy to post something on social media or to make any of those other comments, you know, about not being racist or not being prejudiced, but then not have anything to show for it in terms of our lifestyle or our friendships, relationships or activities. So thank you for saying that so well. Uh, it's kind of interesting that this racial tension resurges in the way that it does with Ahmaud Arbery and then with George Floyd during this time of the coronavirus pandemic. And I don't think that's entirely coincidental. I think, uh, I don't think God sent any of these things, but I think God is always speaking through things of this nature. In Hebrews 12, which has kind of been my theme for the coronavirus pandemic, uh, it tells us to endure hardship as discipline. God's trying to teach us. He'll take even what's bad and try to teach us something. So when you look at the coronavirus pandemic, when you look at the economic challenges that we're facing, when you look at the racial challenges that we're facing, what is God trying to say specifically to the church? And it's also in Hebrews that it tells us when God speaks, not to harden our hearts. We want to hear his voice. What, as a father in the faith, especially in the greater Philadelphia area, what is God speaking to his people, black and white, every ethnicity? What's he saying to his church, especially in our region, but in America as well? You know, even in, in, in doing God's will, it doesn't isolate us from storm. I mean, Peter, you know, he told him, let's go to the other side, knowing full well that a storm was going to come. But uh, he set them out in that storm anyway, really to teach them that no matter how fierce the storm is, no matter how choppy the waters are, I am with you. I am with you. And I think God has sent these uh, crises along now to get our attention. First of all, uh, it, was, it was, the, was the virus. And we all had to, had to stay home. God, God, God will not compete for our attention, but he sure knows how to get it. And for several months, uh, God, God just shut us down. Uh, and and in, in one of the things that I've noticed in all of this, that uh, we have to learn new ways of how to have church. But, but in having church, a lot of the things that we used, uh, a lot of the extra things we needed in order to have church, we didn't have. We didn't have any ushers. We didn't have any parking lot attendants. We didn't have any choirs. We didn't have any hospitality ministry. We didn't have any of that. But when pastors went, whether they used uh, Facebook or streaming live, in that church was, was the man and woman of God proclaiming the word of God to get us to hear the word that, that, that out of all of this, my word will go forward because my word is what sustains you and keeps you and, and saves you. So he slowed us down. But in slowing us down and getting our attention, he sends along this problem of, of George Floyd. That, that was the scene on a movie that African-Americans have lost count on. It happens every day. And, and happens so much, we've gotten numb to it and we just go on about our business. White people just go on about our business. Just another you know, Negro gets shot. But God, God caused this situation to happen right before our very eyes so that we could see the pain that it happened not only to George Floyd, but to every African-American who didn't have the benefit of a camera or anything to get it out in the open. And so what it has done, it has put thousands of people, uh, white and black and green and yellow, every color on the front line talking about racism. God is forcing us to have this conversation. And thank God, there are, there are people who will not have this conversation. And sometimes it's like in your church, there, there are some people, uh, you know, you have to kind of keep them water, keep them fed, and keep them headed toward the kingdom, and keep them out of everybody's hair and way. 
you know, but, but God's work is going to be done. And God would get through what he wants to get through. And I think that what we're seeing now is God's permissive will so that he slows us down, but he sends us this crisis so that we can have this conversation. But then on top of that, we have another pandemic, uh, and that is a presidential election. And I think he sends us uh, this so that we can understand that your salvation is not going to come out any kind of political process, but it's going to be from my word. It's going to be from my word. And uh, I think it's in his permissive will that we learn these, these lessons. And thank God we are having these discussions. We are feeling people's pain uh, about not having adequate health care. Uh, and because of your color, because of your zip code and where you live, that you suffer in a way disproportionate from anybody else. And so when God lifts all of these things uh, before our very eyes, it's up to us to roll up our sleeves with people of faith, regardless of what color they are, to resolve these problems. Amen. I, I love what you say. I, I do believe that you are absolutely correct that a uh, political solution is not going to deal with everything that we need to deal with right now. And unfortunately, between now and November, tensions are probably going to rise. But it sounds like you have hope, and I'm not talking about politically. It sounds like you are a, a man of hope for what God wants to do. And what do you see happening that brings you hope? What do you think God's going to ultimately do out of this that excites you right now and keeps you going and continuing in ministry? Well, I, I see God, you know, incrementally knitting people's hearts together. Um, and, and he's given us this moment to do that. We see more and more people talking together. I suspect that if it had not been for George Floyd, the two of us would not be talking together. We wouldn't. Would not be talking together. But, but here is an opportunity that God has blessed us to talk together and all of the people that you touch and uh, listening to your heart. You know, I can communicate your heart, you know, as a white pastor. You can communicate my heart to a black pastor and lift it up as, you know, this is what God wants us to do. God wants us to enter into each other's pain, but also enter into each other's joys. And so it's good to see all of this. And then the negative stuff that's happening, the burning and the looting, I think is a symptom of a much deeper problem. I certainly don't condone it, but I do understand it. And, and we ought not allow the enemy to hijack what is going on now. And this is our, our, just as we must guard our heart, we must guard the moment that God has given to us to make a difference. And we ought not waste these crises uh, because God has given us these crises to make a difference. And I see it incrementally. I think that the church is, I keep saying this, is the hope of the world. That when you look into the worship around the throne in Revelation chapter seven, you see not just one race, you see multiple ethnicities, every tongue and tribe and nation and people together worshiping God. But the focus is not on our differences. The focus is on the one that we worship, on God. And I think we can demonstrate that right here on earth a little bit, and that'll be attractive to a world that's shattered right now. I think you're right, Pastor. I think God wants to give us a slice of heaven right here. Uh, he wants to want us to see what what heaven is is really like, and we ought not waste this uh, this moment. That we ought to work together and work together and share uh, together to bring about to usher in this new world. We have an opportunity to shape a new world, and particularly here in Philadelphia, one of the great experiences that I had was to co-chair the '92 Billy Graham Crusade, and it was the first time uh, in the Graham Crusade that two minorities uh, co-chaired uh, his crusade. Uh, Nelson Diaz, who was a Latino judge, and myself as an African-American, it had not been done before, uh, nor has it been done since. And so I know from that experience that people can work together, but somehow or another, after 92, we dropped the ball. But one of the wonderful experiences that I had uh, out of that was because a number of African Americans had some issues with uh, Mr. Graham. You know, he always talked about the cross, but not, you know, social action. But that was, you know, that was his thing. That was 
the minister that God assigned to his hand. And so out of that, what I was able to do was to travel to every crusade that he had since then, to meet with African-American pastors, to help to bridge the gap between Mr. Graham and the African-American community to say that God has given him a worldwide ministry uh, and uh, it is worth giving your time to because it's really about the kingdom. It's really about populating uh, the kingdom with disciples and it's a work that we ought to, or we ought to share. Amen. Well, I really appreciate what you've done in that regard. Uh, let me say something that is probably a little bit confessional in terms of white conservative evangelicals. A lot of times we see the political leanings of our African-American brothers and sisters in Christ, and we tend to say, oh, it's just political. They are just taking a political position and at the same time dismiss the political leanings of white people and uh, you know the fact that so many tend to just be of one particular party and so we end up splitting along political lines and just saying, oh, your position is just political or, oh, you know, all you care about is the, the social gospel or, or social justice and you don't care about people's souls. Uh, how, how do you think we can address that wrong stereotype maybe that blacks and whites have towards each other even? How can we address that? Well, you know, I, you know, politically, uh, I'm free, and um, and and I want to be free to vote for the person that espouses a good public policy that's in in my best interest. So I don't get wedded necessarily to a party and may vote, uh, you know, traditionally one way and one party. But I know in Philadelphia that we have a history of. Every, every eight years, every four years, uh, we elect uh, a Democratic or uh, uh, a Republican government. So we go backwards and, backwards and forward. We've had to work with both. And in Philadelphia, in uh, the senator's race, we've had a senator who was a Democrat, but we also had one was a, that was a Republican, and we were voted for them. Uh, and in the city council, likewise, we voted for Democrats, we voted for Republicans, but we've also had uh, stepped outside of both of those and voted for uh, young people that represented uh, progressive ideas. So, uh, you know, we say be free. I say be free. I'm free so that uh, I can flow with, uh, you know, what's in the best interest of, of my people, you know, at, at the time. And I want to get tied to, you know, a particular party because our salvation is not there anyway. King Jesus. I don't allow, I write, I don't allow, I don't allow politicians to uh, pick my fights uh, with my with my Christian brothers and sisters. Amen. Well, are there any things, any issues that you would like to speak to before we wrap it up? Anything that I didn't ask that you have on your heart to share? Well, I, I think maybe just one final thing, and we all it, it's you know this progress of process of bringing people together. It is a process and we have to be patient and work with God. He gives us the opportunity. And I believe that uh, the days ahead of us uh, is certainly much brighter than the days behind us. And unlike the uh, 1960s, uh, we see more young people uh, out there of all different colors, you know, fighting and um, even things that were unpopular uh, to say Black Lives Matter. You know, I mean, it, it created a lot of division, but but we see now professional football, racing, uh, all of them have, you know, moved to a confessional point. Now, that's not something we could have could have orchestrated. God had to do that. And uh, if we stand for God, God will orchestrate the moments that we need. And then the the next point that I would make is uh, I think that what, what we need to what I need to do and what African-Americans need to do is to help white people understand what we're angry about and just, you know, lay it out. And then also uh, the pain of, of, of white privilege and how that hurts us and how it pains us. But yet we have to also understand that that's been a part of white culture ever since they've been here. They had to fight for a lot of things we had to fight for. And uh, we have to understand how that, how that 
that that uh, allows you not sometimes to be as free uh, as you want to be. And we have to understand that and work patiently with both sides until God brings us uh, to, to where it is. And then we'll look back and say, well, what in the world were we fighting about? Well, I really love you, love your heart. We're just now getting to know each other, but I, I just love your spirit. I love what you project and you just sense the, the peace of God and the love of God. It's coming through you and I really do appreciate that. I know it's part of God's healing balm for America right now. So thank you. Thank you. And it's uh, good to chat with you and uh, we'll get a chance to meet personally one day and uh, continue our of friendship and relationship in the body of Christ. Thank you for joining us for Ed Talks. For more information about Victory Church, go to getvictory.net.